SpaceX Starship, IFT-10, launch analysis. What went right, what went wrong? Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. We're coming to the end of some fireside, guys, some fireside. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking space, SpaceX, Starlink, AI. Linux, all kinds of great stuff. So today we're going to be finalizing our coverage on IFT-10. It finally happened. If you guys don't know, we traveled, Shannon and myself, to Boca Chica, and we stayed at Margaritaville. We stayed right next door to the launch site. We ended up going to visit, of course, Starbase, Starbase City, I guess you call it now. And we were literally about a half a football field away from the OLM, Pad A, Pad B, or now they call it Pad 1, Pad 2. We had a lot of fun. It was great to be able to see the entire structure and how everything has progressed. But they ended up canceling the launch. We ended up having to come home home. Then, of course, on the 24th, they tried launching and that ended up being scrubbed because there was a LOX or liquid oxygen leak. And then on the 25th, they ended up scrubbing it due to upper level atmospheric conditions. Basically, thunderstorms were in the area. The following day, which was yesterday, they ended up pulling it off. And not only did the ship not blow up after the first six to eight minutes, like IFT-7, IFT-8, IFT-9 did, it ended up making it and doing a soft splashdown in the Indian Ocean. So I'm gonna go through this timeline so you know exactly what went right, what went wrong, and I'll give you some commentary at the end, and I wanna know what you think about all of this. How do you think that this has progressed them forward to getting to Mars? I will be doing a video on Mars and how we can get to Mars. A lot of people have been asking me for this. It's a little bit more, let's say, detailed, so a little bit more techy and geeky, but. If you like that kind of stuff, you'll like my next or second to next video. So hang tight for that. Anyway, so let's jump right into this video and see exactly what ended up happening. At T minus 15 seconds, the countdown started with absolutely no issues at all, which was nice. Liftoff occurred with no incident. All systems were nominal all the way up to max Q, which was one minute and two seconds into the launch. That max Q indicates peak aerodynamic stress. That is the most stress put on the vehicle on launch. At two minutes and 36 seconds, we saw a super heavy Mako, which is the main engine cutoff. And just two seconds after hot staging occurred, where the Starship ignites and stage separation occurs. And one minute into that, the boost back burn started up with the jettison of the hot staging ring. Now, in future iterations of the Starship, that hot staging ring will become smaller and smaller and not jettison. They will not lose it. It will stay attached. By six right, minutes and go. 20 seconds, super heavy landing burn started. And 20 seconds later, six minutes and 40 seconds, the landing burn shut down. Now, bear in mind, they did change this landing slightly. Instead of landing with three of the Raptor engines, those fully gimbling Raptor engines in the center, they ended up lighting one of the mid-ring engines and only two of the gimbling Raptor engines in the center. This is to simulate an engine out condition and by the looks of it, it was spot on. They landed absolutely perfectly as expected. So they're able to land with two engines instead of three, and that is a major accomplishment going forward. Now, as far as the Starship, by eight minutes and 57 seconds, Starship engine cutoff occurred, and by 18 minutes and 27 seconds, they started deploying the Starlink simulators. Now, if you don't know what the Starlink simulators are, they're basically a mass simulator to the version 
three SpaceX Starlink satellites. So this way they can use the Pez dispenser to launch those out just like they will eventually with the version three satellites. So this was a simulation. It was a test drive, a test run to make sure that the mechanism that Pez dispenser actually worked. These things are massive. They're about 4,500 pounds a piece. I believe the eight weigh right around 16,000 kilo or something. It's a lot. They are not light and they are much bigger than the version two minis that we're currently using that they have 8,200 plus on orbit. These are going to provide a ton more service, a lot about 60 terabits of service more once they are up there per launch. So it's a lot. It is a big deal for us SpaceX Starlink users. Now by 25 minutes and 32 seconds, the Starlink simulator deploy completed. All of those eight were out and the bay door closed. Now this was very important because in a past mission, they weren't able to get the bay door open and they figured out it had to do with pressures. So they depressurized that capsule or that area, the bay area, before opening the bay door and that worked picture perfectly and then they closed it without a hitch also. Now, by 37 minutes and 48 seconds, the Raptor in space relight demo occurred, meaning that they lit one single Raptor engine in space and it relit perfectly. By 47 minutes and 29 seconds, aerodynamic re-entry began and this is where things started getting a little bit sparky. The plasma started pouring off the vehicle and we saw that in the aft section, right around the engines, there was the aft skirt to blow out. That didn't look too good, but it did not affect the structural integrity of the engines because we saw later on it was able to fire those engines back up for landing. We also saw a burn through occur in some of the aft section flaps towards the bottom of them. And that's something that's going to need to be addressed. By one hour and three minutes into the flight, the Starship hits transonic and subsonic by an hour and four minutes minutes. By an hour and six minutes into the flight, the landing flip occurred, landing burn was successful, and there was a picture perfect soft landing in the Indian Ocean. So this was really amazing to see. And I know a lot of the folks over there at SpaceX were very happy to be able to get all of this data now, especially like the TPS people, the people that work on the thermal protection system. They finally have data now that they can use to work on different types tiles, different components, different composites, different types of tiles from metallic to actively cooled instead of passively cooled and a lot of other iterations that they have to do to make this TPS system work. Now, as promised, I said I was going to give you the good and the bad, and that's what we're going to do here. I kind of wrote down some notes about all of the good things and the bad things that occurred and broke them down for you so you know exactly what's going on. There's some questions that are going out there on the interwebs talking about the Bay Area and there was a fire and this type of thing. And I'm gonna get into some of that now with you. Number one, let's start out with the good. Now, we saw Super Heavy end up landing in the Gulf of America without any problem. Now, they didn't bring it in as aggressively as they did in the past, but still, they brought it in hot, let's say. And they ended up landing with two engines instead of three, and it worked out perfectly. So that is a really big success for SpaceX because they were testing that engine out and it ended up performing. So even with one engine out, they were able to land super heavy where they needed to land it, not down the road somewhere. So that's really good. Now, the other really great thing is the ship didn't blow up. With IFT-7, IFT-8, IFT-9, the ships all blew up within six to eight minutes. This time, it made it. And that was a major, major advancement because this is the first time we saw a Block 2 actually make it to space. All year, guys, it's been like eight months and we've not seen one single craft in space. And now it has happened. This is really big, once again, for SpaceX and the people that are working on the ship. Now, that bay door opening was also a really good thing because, once again, in the past, the bay door didn't open. 
They figured out it had to do with pressures. They depressurized this time and it opened perfectly fine, which is great. Also, the really great thing for us Starlink users is they were able to use the Pez dispenser to launch out eight mass simulators of the version three satellites. That is amazing. And when you watch that thing work, it just worked flawlessly. There was a little hiccups here and there, a little bouncing around. They probably shimmed some things to make it a little bit smoother, but it worked. And that bay door closed on schedule like it should. And that's very important too, because if it didn't, the whole craft would be lost. Now, the last really great thing is that Ship 36 actually made it to soft land in the Indian Ocean. But not just land anywhere, down the road somewhere, but actually land where it should have. Now, how do we know that? There was a single buoy camera in the Indian Ocean and it landed right there next to it. So obviously it was landing where it should have. And once again, not down the road a piece. So that is really great. Now there's some bad things, right? There always has to be some good and bad. So to start out with one of the 33 Raptor engines went out. Now, that being said, we don't want to see any Raptor engines go out. But remember, these are not the new Raptor engines. These are the Raptor 2s, the updated Raptor 2s. We're going to see in the Block 3 Raptor 3 engines. And those damn things, they look like something that just came out of Star Wars or Star Trek or something. It is just amazing. There is no plumbing on the outside at all. Whereas like a Raptor 1 literally looks like a spaghetti mess. The Raptor 3 is just sleek. And they they do not need that protecting bell that goes around all of these engines. They can withstand plasma pouring off them and they don't melt. So whatever the material they're using is extremely tough. So that's pretty cool because when we see a block three launch, it's going to look like there's something missing. It's like, where's the rest? There is no rest. You don't need any more. So this is really great. I cannot wait to see the Raptor 3s. Now moving into the engine skirt. That was a problem because we were watching inside that engine bay and we saw the engine skirt blow out and we said, oh, is that going to affect the engines? And luckily it did not affect the engine integrity at all. The skirt on the aft section did blow out. We saw it and all was well. But that's not a good thing. It's something that they're going to have to figure out the cause of it and then fix that. Once again, it did not affect the stability of the craft, which is really good, and the relight of those engines. The next thing that I would have to say is an issue that they need to take care of is the TPS system. The TPS system is the thermal protection system, and that system is what has not been tested for the last eight months because we haven't got a single ship into space for them to be able to test that system. So for the last eight months, all of the folks working on the tile are having to do it theoretically and testing it in a lab instead of actually physically testing them because they kept blowing up before re-entry. So that is a big, big deal. And we saw that on the aft section, there was one of those flaps that were perfectly fine and the other one was melting a pretty good amount. You can see the burn through happening on the lower edge. So that's something that the folks over there that work on TPS are going to have to address because we cannot have flaps melting off because then you don't have a fully reusable rocket, right? It has to withstand the forces and all of the heat of re-entry and then be able to launch again quickly, not replace an entire flap. The next thing that I think is something that we have to look into is the burning or the discoloration that happened right around the bay door. Now, when you look at it, you can see that the stainless steel is extremely charred on the edge line of the tiles. Now, that's problematic because what that means to me is they need to move those tiles further or closer to that bay door. Because that bay door, if you end up getting a ton of contraction and then expansion and contraction and expansion, or possibly even pitting from that heat, from the plasma pouring off it, 
that bay door is not going to work any longer. It's going to work once and then it's not going to work ever again. And once again, that's not going to help for reusability. So they're going to have to do a little bit more wrapping of that tile or that tiling closer to the bay door and possibly look into an edge lining of tile around that bay door also or some type of deflection so that we don't see any of that discoloration happen to the stainless steel. Finally, when we saw that bay door on re-entry, it really was lit up. And I even said on the stream, I said, God, it looks like there's a fire inside the aft section of that vessel. And when I looked at it a little bit deeper last night, pixel and frame by frame, looking at color and different things, charring and whatnot, to me, as of right now, I would say there's probably a 80% chance that there is no, absolutely no fire within that aft section. In other words, in that bay. Because it looks, in the imaging, it looks like you can see flames right around the edge of that bay door. And I personally think that that is actually glint from the sun reflecting at a specific angle. The reason I say this is because you can see it kind of glowing and then not glowing and glowing and not glowing, and you can see the rivets also glowing. Now, that really wouldn't happen from an internal fire exactly like that, I don't think. Now, I could be wrong, but I personally think that this was actually a reflection from the sun and not actually burning within the aft section or in the bay area, let's say. Now, we're gonna have to wait for confirmation from SpaceX, their definitive um, assessment, I guess, on this. But I also think that if there was that amount of flames inside the Bay Area for that period of time, the craft would have blew up before soft landing in the Indian Ocean. That's my personal opinion. What say you down below? So, all in all, this was an amazing end to a journey that myself and Shannon had going to um, Boca Chica, going to Starbase August 3rd and 4th and 5th and 6th and 7th, waiting for this thing to launch and it never did. 20 plus days later, it ends up launching. We ended up having to cover it from our seats instead of on location, which kind of sucks. So for me, it was still great because instead of us being locked out because a launch was happening, we were able to take a day or two to just walk around, go onto the beach, literally be about 50 yards away from the OLM, see how everything is running, take a look at the hopper, go to the bays and take a look at that and everything else. It was really quite amazing to see. So anyways, guys, down below, I wanna hear from you. What do you think about all this? Do you think that this is gonna get us a little bit closer to Mars? Do you think this is going to be something that they're really gonna get a ton of data from and they're gonna move on to Ship 38 and launch it? Or are they going to just skip ship 38 and just move straight into a block three. What do you think? Because ship 38 is ready to go. And if it does launch, it'll probably launch within a month, month and a half, because there's not a lot more to do. They're gonna have to retrofit that OLM with that adapter so that they can static fire the ship 38, but that's really about it. So. Once again, what say you? If you enjoyed all the coverage and everything that we do here, throw the video a thumbs up. Also subscribe if you're not. If you are, thank you, I appreciate that. Click this little notification button here so when I go live or when a new video comes out, you will be notified of it immediately. And if you wanna say thank you for all of the hard work done on this channel, there's a thanks button down here. Click on that, give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. The videos are still free. Speaking about videos, I've put together over 550 SpaceX Starlink videos just for you over the last 52 months. I'll put a link here. You can click on it now if you like. 550 plus videos, helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and of course the why behind it all because this channel is always about the what, the why. Why is more important than how, in my personal opinion. So the why is what this channel has always been about. So anyways, guys, many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, hopefully through SpaceX Starlink, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.